University, and he will uh, tell us about affine Godin models. Please, Sylvain. Thanks. And so let me start by uh, thanking the organizer for this very nice workshop and for inviting me to talk today. And so what I would like to present then in this talk is some introductory review about what are called affine Godin models, and in particular, explain how they are related to integrable sigma models. So we've actually heard about integrable sigma models in the, in the previous two talks, and in particular in Sibyl's talk, we've heard about this, their classical integrability, which relies on the existence of a, a Lux connection that for all these models ensures that there is an infinite number of conserved charges. And also we've heard that at the Hamiltonian level, we ask that the Lux matrix of these models satisfies the Maya bracket, which ensures that these charges are all in involution one over another. And well, I will also come back a little bit on this and will be uh, the starting point from us. In particular, I will develop a bit more something that uh, Siebel mentioned, which is that for these integrable sigma models, this Maya bracket actually takes a quite specific form, which is characterized by a certain rational function phi z, which we call the twist function. And actually this formalism Maya bracket with twist function will be what allows us to then make the link with these affine Godin models. And so Godin models in general, they're integrable systems, which are associated with certain Lie algebras. And they were historically introduced by Godin for the case where the Lie algebra is a finite dimensional simple Lie algebra, in which case we get then what we call the finite Godin models, which are certain integrable spin systems, and it were, which are quite well understood in the literature. But so today I'd like to talk about a slightly different type of Godin model, which we call the affine ones, and which correspond to the case where the underlying Lie algebra is a so-called affine Kaxmo Lie algebra. In particular, this affine algebra is infinite dimensional, which makes the theory a bit more complicated. But actually, one shows that the structure of this algebra is such that in the end, what we get is an integrable field theory with twist function. And in particular, this family then includes integrable sigma models. And so at this point, one can wonder what are the possible applications of having this reinterpretation of integrable sigma models as affine Godin models. And well, the first motivation actually for this reinterpretation was actually to uh, study the quantum integrality. So as we've heard in the previous talk, because of the knowledge locality, this question of quantum integrity is actually quite difficult. And well, the hope here was that actually for finite Godin models, we know quite well the quantum integrable structure. And by making some analogy with the finite case, then there is hope maybe that to get some information about the quantization of the affine case. And there have been some progress in this direction, but for the moment, this is still rather new and it's not yet to the point that it's really concrete applications to integrable sigma models, so th but this is some future perspective. But there are also other um, <clears throat> applications of these uh, affine Godin models, which are still at the classical level. And for instance, one can use this kind of formalism, which is rather systematic formalism, to construct, for instance, new integrable sigma models. And this I will mention a few words about this today. So the idea then for this talk is to give some introduction about these affine Godin models. And well, the plan will be the following. So I will start by some preliminaries about Poisson brackets and tensor notations to fix the notation and the formalism, which in particular will allow me to uh, discuss a bit then this um, Hamiltonian integrity and come back on the notion of my bracket and twist function. So this will be mainly building on what Sibyl said. And then I will go to then the description of these uh, affine Godin models. So as I mentioned, these have an abstract origin in terms of these affine Kaxmini algebra. I will actually not enter too much into the details of this abstract origin. I will actually more focus on um, how to treat these models in the end, but I, I will just say a few words about it. And finally, I will then discuss what the notion of a realization of an affine Godin model, and this is what will allow us to really make the link with integrable sigma models, and particularly we'll say it on a, on a specific simple example. Okay, so let me start when with some general preliminaries about Poisson brackets and tensor notation to fix then the formalism. So we'll be considering an Hamiltonian field theory with one spatial coordinate sigma, which can be either on the real line or on the cycle, and we just put the appropriate boundary condition. And we'll denote the fields of the theory as some rho i sigma. So that the phase space then of the, the theory is just a configuration of these fields equipped with a certain Poisson brackets between the different fields at different values of space coordinates. And the uh, dynamics of the model is then defined by the choice of an Hamiltonian whose Poisson bracket then defined for us what's the time derivative of the theory with time coordinate time. And a canonical example of such an Hamiltonian field theory is if we start with a Lagrangian field theories, which have fields phi i sigma, then I can get to the Hamiltonian formulation of this model, 
And to get the phase space, I first double the, the field. So I add to each code, to each field by I sigma, I, I add the corresponding moment of fields by I sigma. And I equip all these with the canonical brackets, right? We phi with phi and pi with pi is zero. And pi with phi is a Dirac distribution in the um, spatial coordinate and the Kronecker delta. And these phi and pi, they just then the field theory equivalents of the canonical coordinates qi and pi that we have in classical. And in this talk, we'll actually have to uh, use a lot to the um, Poisson bracket of, uh, of fields which are valued in the algebra. So to set up the notation, these are actually the same notations as in Sibyl talk, but just to remind them. So let's consider the algebra G, finite dimensional here, with some basis TA and structural constant FABC, which are defined by the commutation relation in the basis. So typically here, we can think of it as a, an algebra of matrices where the bracket is just a commutator, for instance, SUN, GLN, and so on. And let us then consider fields which are valued in the B algebra. So J sigma and K sigma here. And well, we can decompose them into in the basis that we chose so that we can also see them then as a collections of fields J A sigma, which are then valued in the, in the set of real numbers. And well, using the tensor notation that um, Sibyl introduced, so X1, for instance, is X tensor identity and X2 is identity tensor X. Then we can define a tensor of Poisson brackets of J1 and K2 by taking the Poisson brackets of all the components of these, uh, these fields and contracting it with the basis T at tensor TB. And so this is an element of G tensor G, which is actually independent on the choice of basis and that like uniquely that uh, encode into one unique object, all the brackets between the different components. And to give you maybe a little uh, example of such a tensor Poisson bracket, which will actually be quite useful for us, uh, let me introduce what I call the Katzmodic currents. So let's consider the algebra to be simple here. So it can be SUN, SLN, SOM, which typically for us actually, the, what we, why we do that is then if we take the bit in a trace TATB in our choice of representation, then these define a non-degenerate invariant bit in a form on the algebra meaning that we can take then the corresponding dual basis, TA, and we can then uh, construct the corresponding quadratic speed Casimir that we saw also in Siegel's talk, which is defined then as the basis TA tensored with its dual basis, and it's then an element of G tensor G. And the fact that we actually started with a form which is invariant and the commutation relations actually translate to some identity that are obeyed by this Casimir, which is the following identity here in tensor notation. And with these uh, definitions, one can then define a Kaczmody current as a field which is valued in the Lie algebra and whose Poisson bracket takes the following form here in tensor notation. So we have a, here a commutator proportional to the Dirac distribution and also a term proportional to the derivative of the Dirac distribution with some prefactor L, which is just a constant and which here we call the level of the current. And just as a remark, the fact that this Poisson bracket is Q symmetric, it should be all Poisson bracket then it's just a consequence of this identity that we had on the Casimir that ensures that we can exchange one and two and get a, a minus. And to give them some intuition about how these uh, tensor brackets look like, if we go back to components J, A, Sigma, then actually this bracket is equivalent to the following bracket in components, where for instance here, so we get F, A, B, C, J, C. So these are just like, like the commutation relation of all the algebra, but now it's a field theory version of it where in particular we have this Dirac distribution, for instance. And then here we have the, the derivative of the delta term, then proportional to the odd choice of B linear form. And now well, with the notation, I can come back a little bit on this uh, notion of my bracket that we saw and then go a bit further and discuss this twist function. So as we saw in Tibel's talk, so um, for integrability, we require lax connection, which are a pair of two matrices, L sigma and L tau, valued in the Lie algebra that depend on the auxiliary spectral parameter Z and that satisfy a zero curvature equation, which I And this then gives us an infinite number of concept charges extracting from the lax matrix L sigma and more, more precisely from its monotron. And for these charges to be in involution, we then ask uh, that we have some conditions on the Poisson bracket, the lax matrix. And one of these conditions, which will be the one we'll be focusing on is the Maya bracket, which take the following form here in tensorial notation and which in particular uh, then involve one object, which is the R matrix, which is then this matrix in G tensor G, which depend on the two spectral parameter Z and W. And this R matrix then capture the integrable structure of the theory, the Hamiltonian level. 
And well, one can wonder then, are there conditions on this R matrix? Can you take whatever we want? Actually, this Sibyl's also discussed it a little bit. And for that, we need to look at the properties of a Poisson bracket. So a Poisson bracket should always be skew symmetric, but actually one check that the way this is defined, this is always skew symmetric without any condition on R, but it should also satisfy a Jacobi identity. And that, well, is ensured by asking that the R matrix satisfy the classical young boxer equation, which is this algebraic condition on the matrix R here, which involve then uh, commutators in free tensor, free copy, free tensor copies of the Lie algebra. And a typical example of a solution of this CYB that actually will be useful for us is constructed by taking this split quadratic Casimir C12 that we had before and dividing it by W minus Z. And then, well, if you remember this Casimir, it obeyed some identity respect to commutation, which in particular here implies the following properties. And by reinserting this inside of the CYB, indeed one check rather easily that this is a solution of this classical young boxer equation. And now I can well make a quite simple but actually quite crucial observation for what we would like to for, for what's coming next, which is that if we start with a fixed solution R0 of the CYB, so typically, for instance, this Casimir of the W minus set, then I can construct a novel solution by multiplying it by the function of the second spectral parameter W. And indeed, if we look at the CYB, the second spectral parameter, they always hold Z2 and Z3. So this function, they will just factorize out. And if R0 is a solution, then we get another solution. So we then get an infinite family of solution, which are labeled by this choice of function, which here by convention, we denote by phi inverse. And this is exactly, then this phi is exactly this twist function that I mentioned in the introduction. And well, for integrable signals, at least almost all of them, then uh, they have a lax matrix which satisfies the Meyer bracket and the R matrix takes the following form. What is the R0 depends a little bit on the nature of the sigma model. For most of them, it's Casimir of a W minus Z. For some others, it's a slight modification, but at least for all of them, there is a notion of what is R0 and what is the, the twist function. And in this talk, I will focus just on the case with R0 being the Casimir of a W minus Z. And in particular, we've seen uh, and in, at the end of Siebel's talk that uh, for the PCM, this was the case that we had an R matrix of this form and we saw what was the twist function in this. And so now what I would like to finally get in is how all this relates to then affine good models. So just for a few references, so affine good models, they were historically introduced then by Pegin and Frankel in their paper in 2007. And they were then further studied by Benoit Vicedo in, two, in this paper in 2017. And when in particular, he made the link with integrable sigma models. And what I will say will be mainly a review of uh, these two papers. And some of the results uh, will be also taken from this slightly more recent paper here. So to motivate the appearance of these affine Goddard models, let us consider an integrable field theory with a lax matrix L sigma, and suppose that it satisfies a Maya bracket with twist function phi z as we have. And then to anticipate, we will define a lack, uh, what we will call the Goddard lax matrix gamma, which is almost a lax matrix L sigma, but multiplied by this twist function phi. And let us now suppose for simplicity that phi z and gamma z have only simple poles at some positions that I will call zrs. I will explain a little bit later what happened for higher order pole, but for the moment for simplicity, let us suppose simple poles. So that phi z, for instance, I write it in the following way. We call it zrs in some residues that I call lr, and maybe some constant term also at infinity. And then gamma also has uh, some residues, jr sigma, which by construction are then fields valued in the Lie algebra. And then here, the nice uh, result is that, well, the Maya, because we have the Maya bracket on L sigma, we can translate this to a Maya, to a bracket on the uh, current GR sigma. And the result is that this Maya bracket is actually equivalent to this current satisfying the following uh, bracket here in tensor notation. And well, let us analyze then what we get. So if we take different poles, ZR and ZS with different RNS, then because we have this Kronecker delta, we see that this Poisson bracket then vanishes. So for in the different poles, we have independent uh, current state, they all just Poisson commute. And then we, if we focus on one pole, R equal S, then what we recognize here is just the example of a Poisson bracket that I, I mentioned before, which has these Kaxmudi brackets. So what we get then is uh, commuting Poisson, Poisson commuting Kaxmudi current JR sigma, with some levels LR, and remember these LR, they were just introduced here as the residues 
of this twist moment. And well, just as a reminder, in components, if you go back to components in the basis, then this bracket then looks like that. Too. So what we got here is that then in an integrable field theory with twist function, where here for the moment we focused on the case of simple poles, we're naturally led to having then Katz-Moody currents in the integrable structure of the theory. And the idea as I find Godard model is actually to kind of do the, the opposite. Is we start with the Katz-Moody currents as really the fundamental fields of our theory. This is our starting point. And from there, we want to construct an integrable field theory. So in some sense, I will now forget a little bit about the two previous slides. Of course, there will be a guide for us. But now really, I want to start with the Katz-Moody current and show that they're actually naturally uh, an integrable field theory that appears there. And in particular, what we will discuss in how to systematically define an Hamiltonian from there that ensures that the theory is integral. So these affine Godard models, they then uh, depend on a certain choice of parameters. So are the levels LR and this, what we call the sites ZR, which are then just points in a complex plane. And well, for the moment, I take all of them to be complex. Actually, uh, in the end, to really get model of interest, we should impose some reality condition of them. They're either real or coming by pair of conjugate, but I will actually not discuss this reality condition today for time reason. So everything will be complex here. And then, well, as I said, the uh, fundamental fields of the affine Godel model was then this Katz-Moody current JR sigma, which then defined the phase space of the model, which is equipped with the bracket of n commuting Katz-Moody currents. And in particular, the levels LR in the choice of parameters of the model, they enter the definition of these brackets, so they enter the definition of the phase space. And while these other parameters that are what I call the sites, they actually do not enter the definition of the phase space, but they will, as we will see, they will enter the definition of the Hamilton. And well, at the moment, what we can do is we can take all the defining data uh, for this uh, Godard model, so the levels, the sites, and the Katz-Moody current, and we gather them into two objects depending on the spectral parameter Z, so phi Z and gamma Z, which of course, by what we saw before, will in the end become our twist function and the Godard axiom. And then now what I'd like to show is how from there we construct the Hamiltonian of the model that makes it integrable. And for that, it's actually useful to come back a little bit on this abstract origin of these Godard models that I mentioned. And in particular, to make the relation with how they were historically introduced as spin system. So if we see the Godard model as a spin system, then it also depends on a certain number of sites, which are these points in the complex plane. And to each of the sites, we will attach spin. And what I mean by spin is just some quantum operators, which have the following commutation relation. So if I look at spins at different sites, then they actually commute, so they're independent quantum operators. And if I focus on one site, they then have the commutation relation of just the spin operators with epsilon ABC, the levi chevita tensor. So this is nothing but the commutation relation of the Lie algebra S2 or SO3, if you want just the infinitesimal rotation. So this Godin model at this point, we can see it just as a bunch of sites. And at each of the sites, we attach independent copies of all the algebra S2. And well, this is the quantum Godin model, but actually one can look also at a classical one, which is now that our spins, instead of being quantum operators, they become just classical observable. And instead of having commutation relation, we just now have Poisson bracket. But these Poisson brackets are still then like the SU2 commutation relation. And from there, we can define the Hamiltonian the model by the following. So we define the energy of the site R, HR, by the following expression here, which have some quadratic spin-spin interaction. So yeah, some interaction between the quadratic interaction between the spins controlled by the inverse of then ZR minus ZS. So the positions of the site that then enter the definition of, of the Hamiltonian. And then we define the total Hamiltonian of the system as any linear combination of these HR. And the interest of this definition is that from the commutation from the Poisson bracket of the spins, which is just this SU2 Poisson bracket, one shows that these HR, they actually all Poisson commute one even over there. They are in involution, meaning that they also Poisson commute with the Hamiltonian so that they are conserved quantities. So we naturally then get conserved quantities of involution from this construction. So we naturally get an integrable structure. And actually one can generalize this construction for more general Lie algebras, replacing then instead of attaching a copy of the Lie algebra SU2 to each site, I attach a copy of the certain Lie algebra G. And then there's a way of defining also an Hamiltonian such that in the end everything is integral. In particular, one can do this 
we have what are called an affine flexible DV algebra. And well, as I said, I won't have the time to really enter into the details of what these are. If you're curious about it, you can ask me after the, the talk and I can maybe say a few more words about it. But the idea is that the structure of these affine flexible DV algebra is such that if we attach a copy of this V algebra to each site, this in the end turns out to be um, like attaching a Katsumudi kern to each side. So instead of having spin operators, now to each side, I attach a certain field, JR sigma, valued in the finite Lie algebra, whose commutation relation are this uh, Poisson bracket are the Poisson brackets of these Katsumudi kerns that we have. And now from there, one would like to then define the Hamiltonian of the model. And actually one could do something similar to what we did in the SU2 case to define the H and the Hamiltonian for each side R with some actually quadratic interactions between the, the Kaxmudi current. And well, this actually would work. And what I will present now is actually something which is purely equivalent to constructing these HR in the affine case, but it's some sense choosing an other basis than the HR, which are just the linear combinations of the HR, which actually will be more useful for us uh, for, for later for some reasons. So let me explain then how it goes. So we start with our Swiss function phi z, and we start by then putting in on the same denominator that then allows us in particular to introduce the zeros of the Swiss function, which we call d i, so endpoints in the complex plane also. And to each of these zero, we will then associate a certain quadratic local charge qi, defined as the residue at d i of this quantity qz here, so to construct QZ, we take the Godard X matrix gamma, we contract it with itself to the, the, the choice of bit in the form that we had, we integrate over space and we divide by the twist function. In particular, because we divide by phi, we have then poles at the zeta r's here, so we can define this corresponding residue. And this then by construction will give us some expression, some local charge, which is the integral over the space variable of some density, which is some quadratic combination of our Katsumudi current. And in particular, the, the, the coefficient in this, uh, in this quadratic combination will be related to our choice of parameters z and zeta, which are the parameters in the, um, in the twist function. And we then define the total Hamiltonian of the model as any linear combination of these qi's with some parameters epsilon i here. And well, here also, this definition is such that in the end, from the Poisson bracket of the Kaxmudi current, jr sigma, which are here my starting point, one can show that these QIs are all in involution one way number, meaning that they also commute with the uh, Hamiltonian, so they're conserved. So we naturally also get here some conserved quantities in involution. So this is the first good start towards having the integrability of the system. But because we're looking at a field theory, we would like more than just some conserved quantities in involution. We want like an infinite number of them. And typically we would like, for instance, to have a lattice connection. And this actually can be naturally constructed in this formalism of Hamilton, of affine Godard models also. And well, the way we define a Lux matrix is simply by taking the ratio of the Godin Lux matrix gamma by the uh, twist function phi z. And actually here, this what we do is kind of the reverse of the what we had in these first two slides when we motivated the appearance of Lux Moody current, where we say that if we had a Lux matrix with some twist function, then by defining phi times L we saw that the, um, the residues would be, would be Kaxmudi currents. Now we're kind of doing the opposite. We have the Kaxmudi current is our starting point, which defined in gamma and the twist function phi. And then I define L as gamma divided by phi. And then by construction, this will satisfy the Maya bracket because I started with Kaxmudi currents. And well, just as an observation here, uh, gamma and phi, they have the same poles at the ZR. So these poles will actually cancel together. And in the end, what we get, we get poles at the zeta, so at the zeros of the twist function for this L sig. And if we do the partial fraction decomposition, we actually find that uh, the corresponding poles are like that. So the residues are given by this expression here. And well, to get an integrable model, we would like this uh, Lax matrix to satisfy a flatness condition, so zero curvature equation. And for that, we need to uh, compute what's the dynamic of the Lax matrix. And this, we also know how to do it because we can compute the time evolution of the Lux matrix by looking at its Poisson bracket with the Hamiltonian H. And this is also some computation that can be done from the Poisson bracket of the Kaxmudi current that we start with. And indeed, when one does it, one finds that it takes the form of a zero curvature equation here, where the temporal part of the Lux connection, L tau, 
is defined as follow. And what we see is that it takes an expression which is very similar to the uh, special part, L sigma. But when we sum over the zeros, uh, we introduce these coefficients epsilon i that were here in this Hamiltonian here. So of course, the way we choose our Hamiltonian, the coefficient epsilon i should enter the definition of what is the uh, time components of the lattice connection, because it depends on the dynamic. And so what we get then from this construction is that these affine Goddard models, they always automatically have a lax matrix that satisfies zero curvature equation and a Maya bracket. So they're automatically integral. Okay. So that's for the case with uh, simple poles in the twist function. Let me just briefly mention what happens for higher order poles. So if we suppose that the poles that are can have a certain order MR, which in the terms of affine Godin models, we call them the, the multiplicity of the sites that are. Then in the partial fraction decomposition, in my levels, I get then an additional label P, which goes from zero to multiplicity minus one, which measures then the order of the pole. And similarly, in the Godin axe matrix, my currents now, they have two indices R and P. And these currents then, they are a generalization of the Katz-Moody currents that we had in simple poles, and they are what we call Takif currents. And they satisfy, they should satisfy the following Poisson bracket here, which is a generalization of the Katz-Moody bracket. And so to give an intuition of what this is, so this additional label P, we sometimes call it the Takif mode. And the bracket is such that if we take Takif mode P with Takif mode Q, this closes into the Takif mode P plus Q. If P plus Q is a mode, so if it's smaller than the multiplicity, and otherwise if it's bigger than the multiplicity, then there's no corresponding mode. And then in this case, the Poisson bracket vanishes. And in particular, if we look at P equals zero, which here correspond to then simple poles in, the, in this expansion, then what we see is that mode zero with mode zero closes in mode zero. So we recover then the Katz-Moody bracket that we had before. So it's still true that the, uh, Simple poles are associated with Katz-Moody currents. And then at the higher order pole, we have this generalization, which are these Taki brackets. And then from there, basically everything that I said before generalizes to this higher order case. So for instance, we can still define an Hamiltonian as a linear combination of the epsilon i QIs, where the QI is defined as residues at the zeros of the twist function. And then this still defines an integrable theory in the sense that we will have a lax matrix that satisfies zero curvature equations so of flatness condition and uh, a Maya bracket. So it will be automatically integral. And well, now I would also like to just give a few information about the, the space time symmetries of these models. So, in particular, uh, we define the Hamiltonian of the theory as the sum of epsilon i qi's. And this, in particular, then defines the time evolution of the theory, so the derivative with respect to the time coordinate. We can also look at the derivative with respect to the space coordinates, the sigma, and this by definition is generated by the momentum of the theory. And one can actually show that this momentum can also be expressed in terms of the charges qi, and more precisely, it can be um, expressed as the sum of the qi. And this actually, then what we see is that they're given by the same expression where the epsilon lines are replaced by one. And actually, we saw something similar already in the components of the Lux connection, where the spatial and temporal components of the Lux connection had these two expressions, where here also we had once a sum of with one and a sum with epsilon i here. So there is some kind of a parallel between the space and time directions of the system, which are made through the coefficients epsilon i here. And this can be actually pushed a bit further. And in the end, one can study more concretely the space time symmetries of the system. And well, a bit more concretely, the way we do it is we, we study the energy momentum tensor of the system, uh, which whose basically densities are related by this choice of Hamiltonian and momentum. And in particular, doing that, one in the end finds that the model is relativistic if and only if the corresponding epsilon i is here in the Hamiltonian all square to one. So if they're either plus one or minus one. And this then gives us a very simple condition for the relativistic invariance of the model. And this also is typically one of the reasons why we use this uh, basis QI for the Hamiltonian and not this HR, because for this choice of, uh, ba of basis for the Hamiltonian QI, then the condition for relativistic invariance becomes extremely simple. Okay, so that was more or less what I wanted to say about this 
abstract, I mean, these affine Goda models. And now I would like to uh, define a notion of realization of such an affine Goda model and discuss how this then relates to integrable sigma models. So what we presented before could be seen, uh, could be called then what the abstract affine Goda model. So in particular, uh, it's uh, the model whose fundamental fields are these tachyf currents, right, GRP. And so the phase space is just the configurations of all this current equipped to the tachyf Poisson bracket. And this abstract affine Goda model then depends just on the choice of the twist function phi z of the model that in particular contains the levels which uh, describe what is the, uh, the choice of tachyf brackets obeyed by these, uh, these currents. And to get a realization of an affine Goda model, the idea is to start with a more general phase space with some fields rho i sigma with um, certain Poisson brackets, which are which is given to us, right? And to suppose that by taking well-chosen combinations of the rho i sigma and the derivative, we can construct some object jrp sigma, which satisfy this tachyf bracket. So such that the Poisson bracket between the rho i's implies that these combinations satisfy the tachyf bracket. And because this tachyf bracket is actually the, the starting point from the whole construction of the affine Godin models, and in particular the integrable structure of these affine Godin models, then one can actually translate, transfer all the integrable structure that we had to this new phase space. And then by construction, we get an integrable field theories, but now with these new fields are always sigma. And this is then what we call the realization of affine Godin model, because we realized the tachy currents JRP sigma in terms of these new fields, Roy sigma. And here, just as an observation, although the abstract affine Godin model depending only on the choice of the twist function phi z, it's possible to have different realizations for the same twist function phi z. And well, now what I would like to present is actually how by taking an appropriate realization of an appropriate affine Godin model, one can then get a uh, integrable sigma models. And that I would like to present it on uh, the sim a very simplest example that one can find. And then at the end, after this example, I will discuss a little bit the other possibilities that one can do. So let us consider then a uh, Katsumudi current. And for simplicity, let us consider that the, it has level zero. So we don't have the derivative uh, of the Dirac uh, distribution. And then in components, uh, the Poisson bracket of our current is just the following here. And to simplify things even further, let's consider a very simple Lie algebra, which is the Lie algebra SL2 of two by two matrices. And I take the basis HEF given by these standard matrices here. So now our Coxmoody current has three components, uh, G, H, G, E, and GF, and which have the following Poisson bracket here, which mimic the commutation relation of the Lie algebra of these bases, right? So H with E gives two E, for instance, E with F gives H, and so on. And now I would like to explain how to construct a realization of this, uh, of this um, Kaxmudi current. And for that, so let us first consider the group SL2. And let us put some local coordinates on this group by writing an element of the group as a product of three exponentials in the generators H, E, and F. And so this, well, as a two by two matrix, it looks like this. And this then puts some, defines some local coordinates on the group SL2. And to construct the realization, we'll then consider the phase space of canonical fields on the cotangent bundle T star SL. So this might seem like a slightly technical name, but what it means actually is simply the following. So for the SL2 part here, we're considering the coordinates on SL2, phi i, sigma, phi i, and now we promote them to be fields. So we suppose that they are fields depending on the space variable sigma. And then the T star part here, the cotangent bundle part, means that we just add to these coordinate fields the corresponding conjugate moment fields, pi i sigma. So we double the number of fields. So now we have six fields. And we then equip all these, uh, these quantities by the, with the canonical uh, bracket. So of pi with pi equals 0, phi with phi equals 0, and pi with phi given by the Dirac distribution. And then here, the idea is that uh, by, choose, by defining the following expression here of uh, phi and pi, then one can construct a realization of the Katz-Moody bracket. So the idea is that then that this canonical bracket between the phi and pi 
implies that this quantity satisfies the commutation relation of this category bracket. And this is just a little exercise to check. Well, actually, the, the actual um, expression of this current is not so important. I just gave it here to, to, to see that there is an actual explicit way of realizing it. But then the claim is just that the canonical bracket implies that these are, this is a Katsumudi current. So we then constructed a Katsumudi realization in this phase space. And actually, one can do even a bit more than that. Um, one can actually even consider construct a Takif realization of multiplicity two. So instead of having just uh, one Katsumudi current, which then is Takif correspond to Takif mode zero, which is the one we just defined, we also have now Takif currents of Takif mode one. J1. And here, this one, we define it in terms of the, um, the fields phi i's uh, by the following expression here. Once again, the expression itself is not so important, but it's just to give an idea. And actually, the way we define it, it does not depend on the uh, momenta phi i. It depends only on the phi. But now it also depends on the derivative of the fields phi. And then, well, the claim is that from this definition uh, and the canonical bracket, one checks that this indeed satisfy the Poisson bracket of a Takif bracket, of a Takif currents, with the choice of corresponding level. So L0, which is the level of the Katsumudi current is zero. And then for the level L1, we find one. And so just to remind in components, this bracket, it looks like this, right? So Takif mode P with Takif mode Q should close in the Takif mode P plus P. In particular, well, one observed that because our Takif mode one depends only on the coordinate phi and not on the momenta, if we take Takif mode one with Takif mode one, then actually we'll, this will give zero because there's no phi pi right, in the bracket. And this is what we expect from a Takif bracket of multiplicity two, right? Uh, one with one is now bigger than the multiplicity, so we should not find, we should find zero. And then when we look at zero with one, what we see in particular is because we have this derivative of the coordinates, when we take Poisson bracket with the momentum, we'll find some now derivative of the Dirac distribution. And that is how this comes about. Okay. And so now that we have done this Takif realization, the idea is that we can look at the corresponding affine Godard model. So more precisely, we're considering an affine Godard model with one site of multiplicity two. And we put this site at the position Z1 equals zero for simplicity. So it means that in the twist function, uh, we have a double pole at z equals zero with the corresponding coefficients, which is the level L1, which here is one. In general, we could also have a simple pulse, but here, well, the corresponding coefficient is the Kaxmoody level L0, which vanishes. So we actually don't have it. And then, well, in general, we could also have a, a constant term, which here for simplicity, we fix to one. And then we have the godard axe matrix gamma, which will have a simple pole at z equals zero with the corresponding coefficient, which is the Kaxmoody current J0, and then a double pole z equals zero with the corresponding coefficient, which is this Takif current J1. And now this, because we are in the realization, these Takif currents, they are expressed explicitly in terms of phi and pi by this expression. And then from there, we can construct the model. So for that, we look at the twist function. We find that it actually has two zeros at plus one and minus one. And then if you re recall this, then um, to each of the zero, we associate some local charge, then Q plus and Q minus, which are constructed that residues, as residues of these zeros. And we then define the Hamiltonian as a linear combination of these QIs. And also uh, for the relativistic invariance, as we said, we need these epsilon i's to actually all be plus one or minus one. So in the, in the end, what we choose then for natural Hamiltonian of the model is then just Q plus minus Q minus. And this will, as I said, this Q and plus and Q minus, they're defined as certain residues of which gives in the end some quadratic combinations of these Takif currents. So we can actually compute them explicitly. And this gives us a, an explicit expression of this Hamiltonian in terms of the phi i and phi i. And then by construction, this defines for us an Hamiltonian integrable field theory on T star SL2 with the fields phi i and phi i. And it's integrable automatically because it's constructed from an affine to that Sylvain, you have 10 minutes left. Okay, perfect, thanks. And then, well, from there, this Hamiltonian field theory on T star SL2 with fields phi i and phi i, one can see it also equivalently as a Lagrangian field theory, but now with the fields phi i on. And so for that, we need to eliminate the 
momentum fields, and for that we do the standard thing, we first compute the time evolution of the coordinates field phi i by computing the Poisson bracket with the Hamiltonian. And then the, we invert this relation. So we express the pi i as a function of the coordinates phi and the, their derivative. So this is the equivalent of, of uh, finding p as a function of q dot in, in classical mechanics. And then we compute the action of the model by doing an inverse Legendre transform, which explicitly looks as follow here. So this is the equivalent in classical mechanic of pq dot minus h, right? And then inside of this, we reinsert the expression of pi in terms of the, the coordinates and the derivative. And in the end, we find an action in the form of just a functional that depends only on the fields phi i and their derivatives. And here, well, I will skip all the, all the details of, uh, of the computation. One can do it and then in the end get the action. And just, well, I will present the end results. And actually the end result will be very easy to, to describe. If we remember that the fields, these coordinates phi i, we introduce them by for parametrizing, sorry, uh, an element of the group as a product of three exponentials. So instead of having three fields phi i, I can say that's just being one field g, but now valued in the group SL2. And in terms of this field g, what we find in the end for the action is simply the following here, where so d plus and d minus are the derivative respect to the, uh, <clears throat> to the light cone coordinates. Uh, so sigma plus or minus two divided by two here, well, Anyway, and then we find then this trace of g inverse dg, g inverse dg. And this for, from Sibyl Stoke, we recognize this as being the action of the principal Carroll model on the group SL2. So what we saw, so what we saw so far then is that um, the principal Carroll model on SL2 is just a realization of an affine Godard model with one side of multiplicity two. So this is the main example I wanted to, to present in a bit of details. And I'll just, uh, in, the, in what's left to me, so what, what time it less. So let me just explain a little bit what else we can construct and gives then a little panorama of the different affine Godard models one can construct. So first of all, this construction we did for SL2 can actually be generalized to any simple Lie group G. And so we then get the principal Carroll model on any Lie group G as a model which has also one site of multiplicity two but well, now we have an underlying uh, Lie algebra, which is different. And we also then need to change the way we define the, uh, the realization. So this explicit realization I gave in terms of phi and pi, we can generalize this to any group. And actually, I mean, in the end, because we want to go to any group, it's nice to find a way that is actually coordinate independent. Here I went to coordinate to give an explicit expression, but there is a more abstract way of defining it, which in the end does not depend on choosing co explicit coordinates phi. And well, there is also the possibility of doing Young Baxter and lambda deformations that were mentioned by Siebel, right, of the principal car model. And that, well, the way we do it is we actually take now this time two sides of multiplicity one. So, in some sense, the effect then of, of this deformation is it takes the site of multiplicity two of the PCM, which is then a double pole in a twist function, and it splits it into two, a pair of simple poles. And when, then we also need to change the corresponding realization. And these are then examples of just uh, previously known integrable sigma models, which were then reinterpreted as a fine Godard model. And this was done then in this paper by Benoit Visser. But as I mentioned, one can also take this in a kind of other way around and use these affine Godard models, in particular use the fact that they give us a systematic way of having integrable field theories to then construct new integrable signals. In particular, for instance, this was done in, in this paper. And the idea was, to start with actually rather simple, is if the PCM is a model with one site of multiplicity two, then let's look at a model with n sites of multiplicity. Two. And to each of these sites, we attach then independent copies of the realization we found. And this in the end, well, you can do the same thing. You do the Hamiltonian uh, analysis, the inverse Legendre transform. And in the end, you get a new integrable coupled model, this time on n copies of the Lie group. And well, if you do all the details, then the the inverse Legendre transform is slightly technical, but in the end, you get something like that. So the action depends on n uh, fields gr, which are valued in the, the group. And they all possess what is called the Vesemino term. So I won't enter into the details of how this is defined. It just appears in the action with some coefficients kr. And then there are some PCM-like terms, which now also have some interactions between the different copies controlled by some coefficients for rs. And well, this uh, model for generic row and k 
it's actually not integrable at all. But because here we have a construction that comes from affine Gnomo, it's automatically integrable. And this gives us some specific values of rho and k that ensures the integrability of the model. And well, I won't give these expressions here, but it can be found in the article. And well, just to complete a little bit then this, um, this panorama. So in addition to these models on, well, group or deformations of group or copies of group, there are also what are called in the coset models, which are defined on a group quotiented by a certain specific subgroup H. And these can also be seen as um, affine Godard models, but of a slightly different nature, which are which is called dihedral affine Godard models. And well, this dihedrality, I won't enter too much into what it is. It has to do with this choice of subgroup H. And it changes a little bit the way we define the model. In particular, just to mention it, it changes. Um, this is what actually changes this R0, this fixed R0 solution that we had in the definition of the twist function. Actually, when I said that it depends a bit on the nature of the model, well, for coset models, then we have a different R0, but which is also a fixed solution that depends on this choice of H. Typically. And then, well, basically, every, I mean, all the things are generalized to this case, and we have a definition of what is the Godard model in terms of Takif currents and so on, and then we can realize the coset model as these diagonal of fine numbers. And this, in particular, for instance, um, contains solution uh, sigma models on the spheres or on ADS faces and so on, which are realized as as particular cosets. And here, also looking at a diagonal model, but this time with n sites, we can get a new integrable sigma model. And here, you get in the end a model on the coset of n copies of the Lie group G by a certain diagonal subgroup H. And this is what was done uh, in this recent paper with Davo Chinoff and, and Christian Bassi, for instance. So that then more or less finish I want, what I wanted to say on about this panorama and just then as a few, let me finish by a few conclusion and perspectives. So I guess the main message of this, uh, this talk was that integrable field theories with this function, they are deeply related then with affine Godard models and they can be reformulated as affine Godard models. And in particular, by looking at realizations of these affine Godard models in well chosen phase space, one can then recover previously known integrable sigma models, but also then construct new ones. And this allows us to then explore in a kind of systematic way this, this panorama of integrable sigma models. And a long term goal then in this, in this direction would be, for instance, to even classify maybe this, this panorama of integrable sigma models. And to finish, let me maybe. Um, finish with some few perspectives and relations with other domains. So for instance, uh, one of these domains would be an approach, a new approach of integrable field theory that was recently proposed by Costello and Yamazaki, and which is based on a certain four-dimensional variant of the chan simons theory. And this actually, it was shown that this has a very deep relation with affine Godard models. In some sense, they're just the two faces, one at the Lagrangian level and one at the Hamiltonian level of the same underlying theory. And in particular, the twist function that played a crucial role in the affine Godard model also play a crucial role in the 4D chen Simon sphere. And in this formalism of 4D chen Simon sphere, recently, all this was also related to uh, the notion of e-models. And actually this I mentioned because it makes a bit of relation with the talks of tomorrow, because the e-model was historically introduced um, as a, some kind of a double formulation of certain sigma models that make the duality property manifest and more precisely the Poisson T dualities. And the result then of this construction is that in the end, among these models, a large class of them can be integrable and they're more or less equivalent to affine Godard models in 40 chen Simon theory. And well, finally, well, everything that I said so far was at the classical level. So of course one can wonder what happened at the quantum level. And so let me just, of course there would be a lot to say here, but let me just say a few words that maybe resonates with what I said in, in this talk. So in particular, one remark is that this twist function that was important at the classical level also seems to play an important role in the renormalization property of this system. And at least as was shown in, in this uh, recent paper here in some exp specific example, it seems that the one loop RG flow of these models can be encoded in a quite compact and simple way just in terms of the twist function. And also well, a natural question, of course, is the question of the quantum integrability of these models and well, of the one we previously known and also the, the new ones. And this, well, as we said, is a difficult question, but I mentioned in production, there is maybe hope that affine Godard models can provide us with a formalism that actually is useful to this thing. And well, also uh, another question is, can we apply 
even maybe without really proving quantum integrity, but supposing quantum integrability, can we apply uh, factorized scattering theory? And then, for instance, the thermodynamic death ends up, so things like that, and we'll do things like uh, that we, we saw in Stein talk. In particular, so this was done for some of these models, but then for the new uh, examples, uh, for the moment, this was not done, and then it would be maybe interesting to see it. And that then finishes my talk, and I thank you all for your attention.